Uh, in this video, I'm going to go through the uh, AQA um, AS paper um, from May 2016. Okay, paper one. And I'll just cover half the paper in this video and do the, the second half in, the, in a, a later video. Okay. Right, the, this question is about electronic configuration. So I've got the periodic table there. The full electronic configuration of an aluminium ion, aluminium atom, sorry. Right, so we have the aluminium atom, we've got uh, 1s2, that's filled up. Uh, 2s2 is filled up. Uh, 2p is all filled up, 2p6. Uh, 3s is filled up. 3s2 and we've got one electron in 3p, 3p1. Right, now for a chromium ion, let's first of all do it for a chromium atom. So we're gonna have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, um, and then we're gonna have, right, so, Chromium, you might expect chromium to be 4s2, 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4, sorry, 3d4. But if you remember, it's not that, it's, <coughs> it tries to get a half filled half shell. So it, it's actually 3d5, 4s1, that doesn't really matter in this question. Uh, we're gonna lose three electrons so we're going to lose the 4s1, that always is the first to go, and we're going to lose 2 from 3d, so that'll be 3d3. Right, 1.2, deduce the formula of the ion that has a 2 plus charge of the same electron configuration as krypton. Okay, now, here's krypton. Uh, now the ion it's got the same electron configuration it must have two more protons so it's this not this element here this element here which is i've chopped it off but it's strontium okay it's sr in group two all right okay deduce the formula of the compound that contains plus two ions and plus three ions that have both have the same electronic configuration of argon Right, so the plus two, these are here's argon. Plus two, it's uh, got the same electrons, but it's got two more protons. So that takes us potassium, calcium. So that's Ca2 plus. And the three minus ion, well, that's going to have three less protons than argon. So chlorine, sulfur, it's phosphorus, P3 minus. So the formula of that compound would be, ionic compound would be Ca3, P2 calcium phosphide. Okay, so that is the answer to 1.3 there. Okay, deduce which of Na plus and Mg2 plus is the smaller ion. Now they both have the same electronic configuration. Um, they're both 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So they're both that at sodium uh, and magnesium. But of course, Magnesium has is atomic number twelve, so it's got twelve protons in the nucleus. Uh, sodium's only eleven, so the magnesium is going to be holding those electrons in more strongly because it's got twelve positive charges in the nucleus. So it's Mg two plus greater nuclear charge. All right. Uh, an equation to represent the process which occurs when the ionization energy for sodium is measured. It's a fairly standard question. So that's going to be uh, Na gas. You've got to have the state symbol goes to Na plus gas plus an electron. Okay, I've just pasted in period three there because we need this for this question. The first ionization energy, some period three elements are shown in figure one. Complete the figure by plotting the approximate first ionization energies for magnesium and sulfur. Okay, now we've got uh, sodium here. 
don't forget that electron is coming from 3s. Magnesium, it's also going to be coming from 3s, but it's got greater nuclear charge, so it's going to be a bit higher. Uh, this drop here is because that's 3p for aluminium. That's coming from 3p. That's coming from 3p. Right, now we the uh, the first ionization energy for sulfur, if you remember, right, so this is for phosphorus. The P orbitals are going to be filled like that. That's phosphorus. But with sulfur, you're going to have to have start pairing the electrons up. So the P electron, first I, the, the, the electrons to be removed comes from the P orbital, but it's paired up. So it's slightly easier to get rid of because uh, of the repulsion. And so it is just a little bit lower there. It's, you would expect it to be higher and it's not, it's lower. So there's about the right sort of range. Um, explain why the first ionization of sulfur is different from that of phosphorus. Well, uh, again, just to explain that in terms of pair repulsion, it's a little bit lower than you might expect, lower than phosphorus, slightly lower than phosphorus is, even though the nuclear charge is greater um, because it's paired in the p orbital. Right, there's a titration question. Right, so uh, we get a metal carbonate uh, dissolves in water and reacts with hydrochloric acid in a one to one ratio. We can see there. So the student was trying to find out the value for the MR. So we dissolved some of that into 250 centimeters cubed and then took a tenth of that out for titration against 0 0.102 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid. Okay, so the first question, calculate the mean titer and use this to determine the amount in moles of HCl. So you should only use concordant titers, i.e. within 0.1 centimeter cubed. So it's only those two you should use for your average. So the mean would be 9.70 centimeters cubed. That is our titer, right? You shouldn't use the other two, okay? Right, uh, determine the amount in moles of HCl. So Moles HCl is equal to the concentration times the volume. The concentration was 0 0.102 mole per decimeter cubed, it told us, and the volume is 9.7 over 1,000 dm cubed. And that is equal to <coughs> 9 9 9.894 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of HCl. Right, calculate the amount in moles, the next question, calculate the amount of, of, of the hydrogen carbonate in 250 centimetres cubed of the solution. Then calculate the experimental value for the MR. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Right, so we've got this many moles of hydrochloric acid, okay, and that reacted with, we had our conical flask there, and we had our HCl coming into it. Here we had 25 centimeters cubed of our MHCO3 solution. Okay, now it's a one to one ratio, the hydrochloric acid reacting with the magnesium hydrogen carbonate. So, therefore, we're going to see the moles in 25 centimeters cubed is going to be the same as this here. But if you read the question, uh, this came from 250, and that was, well, they made up a solution of, of, of the hydrogen carbonate in 250. So the moles of it uh, in 250 is equal to 9.894 times 10 to the minus 3, 10 times that value, yeah. Okay, now we also know that the mass uh, in 250 was equal to, and it gave it in milligrams, it said it's one, one, four, six, four milligrams, okay, of the MHCO3. That's equal to 1.464 grams. Now we know that moles, we need to find out the, the whole idea is to find out the MR. We know that moles is equal to mass over MR. So we know that the MR then, the range is got to be equal to the mass over the moles. 
So that's equal to 1.464 grams over 9.894 times 10 to the minus three. Uh, that is equal to 147.96, that's the MR. But it says, give it to an appropriate number of significant figures. When you look at all of the data, it was all given to three significant figures. So we should give our final answer to three significant figures. So we should give that as 148. Okay. Now, the student identified the use of the burette as the largest source of uncertainty in the experiment. Using the same operator suggests how the procedure could be improved. Right, now, if you remember the final titer was quite low. It was 9.70 centimeters cubed. Uh, that normally we would be aiming for a titer of around about 25 centimeters cubed. Uh, this is too small and the the percentage error, because the burette is accurate, so uh, plus or minus 0 0.1, sorry, plus or minus 0.15 centimeters cubed. We don't really need to say that, but the uh, and so that is a is a considerable proportion of 9.7. So if you if you can increase the volume of the titer, you can decrease the percentage error caused by the burette reading. Okay. So what we need is we need a, a larger burette reading. And well, how can we achieve that? Well, we, 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 could, we can make uh, the acid more dilute, use more dilute HCl, and you're gonna need a greater volume of it. That's one way of doing it. Or the other way you could do it is make, uh, use a greater mass of the um, HCO3, then you're going to have more moles of it. And you're going to need more moles of HCl. So either one of those two is is the way to do it. So one for one mark for saying the you need a larger burette reading, and the second mark for how you would achieve that by changing the concentration of either solution. Right. Okay. Uh, so this question here is really required practical one B: how to make up a standard solution that's what they're asking you here uh, so the student needs to make up 250 of an aqueous solution containing a known mass of the, of the hydrogen carbonate is provided with a bo sample bottle containing the air uh, okay so describe the method so what would you do right you would get a uh, take a beaker a 250 centimeter cube beaker. Um, and you tip it, you would weigh, weigh the sample bottle before. And then you tip in your solid. Weigh the bottle again afterwards. And you find out the mass added by subtraction. So you do that. Now, once you've got your solid in the beaker, then you would dissolve that in not 200, you're gonna make 250 centimeters cubed in the end, but you're not gonna dissolve it in 250, dissolve it in like so 100 and 150 or something like that. Okay, so you're going to uh, dissolve your solid in approx 150 centimeters cubed and stir with a glass rod. Right, when you've done that, you are going to transfer that solution to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. That's one of those ones that look like that sort of shape. And they've got a little mark there, 250. Okay, so transfer it to the volumetric flask. And then importantly, wash the beaker with distilled water and transfer the washings. 
that's to make sure you've got all of the solid going into the 250 volumetric flask uh, and probably do that twice at least twice okay when you've done that then you add uh, distilled water uh, up to the mark okay up to this mark on the volumetric flask and then finally really important because you otherwise you're going to have a lot of distilled water here it's going to be dilute you need to stop at the flask and invert it to mix okay so if you get all of those points you'll get six marks really okay right and as I say, that's required practical 1B, right? Here is about structure and bonding. Table 2 shows some data about the elements bromine and magnesium, okay? In terms of structure and bonding, explain why the boiling point of bromine is different from that of magnesium. Okay, let's do that first of all. Right, the brom right we need to say, first of all, bromine, BR2 molecules, covalent molecules, uh, it's got a low melting point because all the only interactions you've got between those molecules are going to be van der Waals forces uh, because they're small molecules and that's why it's got a, a low boiling point okay um, for magnesium what we need to say magnesium is a metallic lattice and we need to sort of explain what that is. So it is a regular arrangement of Mg2 plus ions uh, in a sea of delocalized electrons. And then you probably need to say it's got a high melting point because of the strong electrostatic interactions. Between the positive ions. And the delocalized electrons, which are negative. OK, now this last point here, why? Why is magnesium a liquid over a much greater temperature than the range compared to, to bromine? Again, it's because even when it is a liquid, uh, you still have these strong electrostatic attractions between the positive ions and the delocalized electrons. And they are a lot stronger than the van der Waals forces, which you're going to get in the bromine liquid. And so you need a lot more energy to turn it into a gas. So it's a liquid for a larger range. Okay, that is all you need for five marks. Right, this is a rather unusual um, ideal gas uh, calculation, this one, okay? So you've got two uh, flasks uh, with a tap. P is empty at the moment, and in Q we have got some ammonia, okay? Um, and we've got to calculate the mass of ammonia in flask two. So P is empty, we don't worry about that one. So what we need to do is find out the number of moles of ammonia, N, and then we're going to use um, mass is equal to moles multiplied by the MR to work out the mass of ammonia. How are we going to find out N? We're going to use the ideal gas equation. PV is equal to NRT. So N is equal to PV over RT. We've got to be really careful with units, especially the way they've presented the information here, rather confusing way. So they said the volume is 1.0 times 10 to the 3 centimeters cubed. Right, now we need to convert that into meters cubed. And so we need to divide it by a million. So the volume in meters cubed is going to be that over 10 to the 6. So that's equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed. We need to do that first. Right, so N, now the pressure we have to be careful. We have not kilopascals, we need to put that into pascals. Um, times 10 to the minus 3. Um, R, they give us is 8.31. And the temperature in Kelvin, they give us is 300 Kelvin. So that number of moles is equal to 
0 0.04091. So the mass is going to be equal to uh, moles times MR. So that's 0 0.04091 multiplied by 17, which is the MR of ammonia. That gives us 0 0.6955 grams. Uh, we need to give it to the correct number of significant figures. Well, everything is given to three sig figs there, so we should give that to three significant figures. So it's 0 0.696 grams of ammonia. Now, we're going to need this number for later on for the next bit of the question, I think. So remember that. Okay. Now, uh, I think in the next part of the question, it says they open the tap so that the ammonia is going to come out here. So the volume is going to increase. Uh, the pressure is going to drop and the temperature will drop. But the number of moles N is, is obviously going to stay the same. And we need to use that to work out the new volume. OK, okay so just look at the next question. All right, so they open the tap. Yeah, the temperature decreases by 5 degrees C. So that means they've gone down by 5 degrees C, the same as 5 Kelvin. So that's 300 minus 5, that's 295 Kelvin. It's gone down to. Okay. Um, and the number of moles, I said, obviously is going to remain the same, which is equal to point, point zero four zero nine one. Okay, so we, we need to work out the new, the volume of the flask feet. Well, the total new volume and use PV is equal to NRT. You have to be careful here because this total volume is the volume of, of P plus Q. Uh, okay, so, and then we're gonna just subtract the, the, the volume of Q. So V is equal to NRT over P. Put the new numbers in. Well, we get 0 0.04091, 8.31, new temperature, which is 295. Uh, and uh, the new pressure, which has gone down to 75 kilopascal, 75,000. So the volume, do that, we get is equal to 1.337 times 10 to the minus 3, and obviously the volume is going to be in meters cubed. Okay, right. So now I said that this is the volume. This volume here is the volume of P plus Q. So we want to find out the volume of just um, P. So the volume of P is going to be equal to the total volume, that many meters cubed, minus the volume of Q. In meters cubed, we had before, that's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed. That is going to give us a 0.337 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed. But we need to give the volume in centimeters cubed. So multiply that by a million. And that gives us 337 centimeters cubed to three significant figures. Okay. Right. This is about the time of flight mass spectrometer. Okay, explain how ions are accelerated. Let's do that first. How are they accelerated? Well, you have positive ions. And they're accelerated by an electric field. Remember, you have a plate which is uh, negatively charged, no, held at a negative voltage. Uh, that makes, so there's an electric field there that will accelerate them. How are they detected? Well, the um, uh, the the detector uh, provides electrons, negative electrons, to the incoming positive ions when they hit the plate when they hit the detector. And how is the abundance determined? So you get a flow of electrons to the detector i.e. that's an electric current. 
and the abundance is uh, dependent on the size of the current. Proportional to the size of the current. And there's your three marks there. Okay. All right, now here we go. Calculating the mass in kilograms of a single chromium 52 plus iron. Okay, so one mole of those ions, mass of one mole is, the, is, is going to be 52, isn't it? 52 grams. Okay, so the mass, this is equal to uh, 52 times 10 to the minus three kilograms, because we need to do it in kilograms. That's for one mole. So the mass of one ion well, how many ions are there in a mole? There's that many. So divide that by the Avogadro number. And that gives us a value of 8.635 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Okay. I think we need that value for the next bit as well. Okay, in a time of flight mass spectrometer, the kinetic energy of a chromium ion was, was this. So calculate the velocity of the ion using this equation. Right, right let's uh, rearrange that then. So we're gonna get V squared, I'm gonna leave it as a squared. V squared is gonna be equal to the kinetic energy divided by a half times by the mass of the chromium 52 ion. Let's put our numbers in, we get 1.269 times 10 to the minus 13 divided by a half times 8.635 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. We calculated that earlier. So V squared is 2.93 times 10 to the 12. Take the square root of that to give us V. Uh, that gives us 1.71 four times 10 to the six meters per second. Right, so to three significant figures, that's going to be, uh, I know they've given that to four, but I'll just give it to three. Um, seven, one point, sorry, 1.71 times 10 to the six meters per second. Right, now for this equation, for this question here, and I've just cleared that up a little bit, I'll just rub that out so we can see what's going on a bit better. I've drawn, just save a bit of time. I've drawn one of these diagrams, which you're probably familiar with from doing probability GCSE maths. Right, okay. Um, so bromine's got two isotopes, 79 and 81 here, okay. Right. Uh, in approximately equal abundance. Sketch the pattern of peaks you would expect to see in the mass spectrum. Well, obviously, we're going to get three different peaks because we can, bromine exists as BR2. So we could get a 79 molecule of 79, which would weigh um, 156. And we could get uh, one, a 79 and an 81. That would weigh 158. Sorry. Or the third option we could have is an 81 and an 81. That would give us 160. Um, and we, we, we need to talk about how what the abundances of those going to be. Well, look at this little tree, okay? So, see, if our first bromine in the molecule is 81, what's the chances of that? That's a half, isn't it? One in two. And if the second one is a bromine as well, that's also a half. So the probability of, of this one of having two 81s, that's a half times a half, which is equal to a quarter. Right, this one here, now if you the first one is, is an 81 and the second one is a, is a 79, that's a half, so that's going to be a quarter as well. Likewise for all of these, that's going to be a quarter. But look, you've got a double chance of this one at 160, is two quarters, so that's a half. And finally that one, that one will be a quarter as well, won't it? Okay, so the middle peak, this 160, is going to be twice as high as the other two peaks. Now, they've asked this question for chlorine as well, where chlorine is a bit more complicated because chlorine is 
the two isotopes, one's three quarters and one's a quarter. Anyway, so you want that one 50% is going to be the 160. 25% uh, should be the 162. And 25% should be the 158. That's going to be the graph. Okay. Right, a sample of xenon has a at relative atomic mass of 131.31, and there are four isotopes. The abundances of the isotopes are shown, and the data for one of the isotopes, okay, so they won't tell you the, uh, the they haven't told you the abundance of that, and they haven't told you the mass of it either. Right, to work out the abundance of this is pretty easy, so it's 100 minus 28 minus 25 minus 27, that's equal to 20%, okay? But we need, how do we find out M? Well, we know that the, the relative atomic mass, uh, 131.31, well, that's equal to the abundance of this one. So that we'll, it's rather than the percentage, I'll put it down as 0.28 multiplied by 129, plus the abundance of this one. So that's going to be um, 0.25 multiplied by 131, and plus 0.25. 0.27 times 132. And this one is going to be plus, well, it's 20%. So that's 0.2 multiplied by M. We don't know the mass of that one. So let's work that out. We get 131.31. All of that lot, if you're doing a calculator, that comes to. A hundred and four point five one plus point two M. So that means we subtract, so we get uh, uh, one three one point three one minus one hundred and four point five one is equal to point two M. So point two M. is equal to, you subtract that, you get, what is it? 26.8. So M is equal to 26.8 over 0.2. And that is equal to 134 exactly. So the, um, the mass of the, mass number of the missing isotope is 134. Okay. Now, I think that is the last question I'm going to do in this video. I'm going to carry on with the paper in the next video.